live everything up. Okay, so now, and where OBS is recording? Yes, it should. Uh, okay, so now everybody's coming in. And, okay, I think we're live now, so let me see. I'm going to pull up the... Oh, we are live. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. We're good. Okay, it looks like everybody's coming in, and maybe we'll give them a minute or two to, to come in and join us. Um, in the meantime, hi everybody who's in here. Sorry about that. As you know, um, this is our technology. Can you go check with Corey and see if he got, was able to get the link? Um, so you guys will have to bear with me. Uh, live streaming, just like with everything else, is a little bit new for me. So I'm going to deal with this the best I can. If anyone has any questions, we are on a live chat, so please feel free. I will be checking it. If you see me looking over, it's just because I have it on another screen and I'm checking it. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Beth Fine. I'm the president of BWA Video, one of the largest legal video firms, I'm proud to say, in Texas. I'm happy to speak to you today. I'll be speaking about video conferences during our stay-at-home orders. I want to introduce you to Mr. Benny Augusta with Abraham Watkins, the HBA president, and he's going to let you know a little bit about what we're doing today. Thank you, Beth, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us here today. Uh, I am Benny Augusto Jr., the current president of the Houston Bar Association, and as a benefit to our members and to all lawyers in Houston and, and the legal uh, world of Houston. We are here today offering this free live stream CLE. It's going to be saved and put onto the HBA.org website, our website at the Houston Bar Association. So today we're happy to, to have you and present practicing law in the times of coronavirus, how to conduct effective hearings and remote depositions. We've been working already uh, remotely, a lot of us, and a lot of us, in fact, you'll hear more later, we've been in depositions this week doing remote depositions. So the purpose today is to learn how this happens, how it can improve your practice, and how to watch out as lawyers to your ethical responsibilities to your clients. So I wanna thank, before we go on, Beth Fine of BWA Video. She's our host today, and uh, we appreciate all the work she does for our uh, CLEs and our in our website to get us up and running and functioning, and especially today, Beth. So thank you, Beth, take it away. We thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I just got a note from my tech person. Um, so I can moderate the other one, tell people to move. Actually, and we copied and pasted that. Hang on one second, guys. I gotta put something in my chat room. Okay, Alex, I put it in the chat. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Again, we're just trying to make sure everybody has the, the new link to get in. Um, it's, oh, and I don't know what the old one is. You sent it in an email. You'll have to get into my contact. At okay. Sorry, guys. Again, we're trying to make everything happen. So, again, I'm Beth Fine with PWA Video. Uh, the one thing I, um, I, I want to say is we've been doing video conferencing for several years. Um, there are every, many people are hearing about Zoom and how important that is. Uh, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. They they have a free trial. Many of the video conferencing now has free trials. You can certainly get on. Some have limitations because they are offering free trials. But I encourage you to not just use one specific video conferencing and get comfortable with that. I would encourage you to be get comfortable, have an open mind about using different video conferencing sites. The one I'm going to work with you today is is what I use and I'm comfortable with is Adobe Connect. It has a lot of different things that you can use as attorneys, as if you're um, doing a mediation. We have breakout rooms that are very secure and private. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that today. Obviously, the first thing I'm going to admit from the start is we all want to be with each other, especially now. I think we're all getting tired of uh, looking just around our houses. So uh, the personal interaction, especially in a deposition, is very important for uh, the attorney questioning the witness. See, just being there is super important. I, I don't downplay that at all, but obviously that is not happening for us. So we are going to the next best thing. Very important is your internet connection. You need to have, uh, unless you're the witness, 
a camera, a webcam is not a dire need. If you're the witness, obviously you need a webcam because everybody's going to want to see you. Everyone needs some mode of um, headphones or a speaker so they can be heard. You don't necessarily need to be seen. All of everyone, I they don't necessarily want to be seen today, but I've asked them so we could all watch them today. But you can certainly listen and be a part of this and see everything that you're seeing on the screen without your picture being seen itself. Obviously, we'd all love to be at home in our t-shirts and shorts or sweatpants without doing our hair. But when you do do a deposition in this new environment, you still, this is very, this is still a legal proceeding. You still need to act like you're, you're taking an oath, just like you're in front of a judge and a jury. So you definitely want to look the part. You know, brush your hair, brush your teeth, you, all that kind of stuff. If you're going to join, and you, especially if you're coaching your witness or explaining to him, have him try to put himself maybe against a, I'm lucky, I have some professional equipment so I can put a backdrop up. You see, most of our panels has um, their, from their home. You can see their windows. That's fine. You know, obviously, if you have a nice clear wall that you can put your laptop up against or something, would be great. So the, the, less, the less that we give a jury to focus on, the better it is um, if we play this video back. These videos, everything that you're seeing here, we can record. You can still, if you order a video, you will still see just the witness in your screen. When you get your video, all this other stuff will not be here. This is just for the presentation during your, your deposition. Um, I'm trying to read, look for my notes, so if you guys will bear with me. A lot of times when we're doing a deposition, I wouldn't recommend this obviously with a mediation, but when you're doing a deposition, we request that you call in on a teleconference, set up a conference line. Anyone who has ever done these before knows that, especially since everyone's working at home, they don't have top-notch internet, that there's going to be some lag. When you are doing a deposition and you have multiple parties and you have a court reporter that's trying to write down everything that's being said, when the lag starts to come in, it gets very frustrating. And this isn't easy for all of us as it is, and having that kind of lag or somebody getting knocked off is frustrating. So if you're on a teleconference, if you're on a telephone conference call, you at least have nice, steady audio. So if somebody does get knocked off, or if somebody's child decides to start you know, streaming YouTube videos and it starts to take your bandwidth away, you can, um, you'll still have a nice, even, audio flow, which is very important. The court reporter can capture still what's being said, and, and that will help. So I think we've covered the reliability. Definitely, if you can hardwire into your modem during a deposition, during a video conference, you, you would want to hard, hardwire in. It's better than trying to find a Wi-Fi signal. And obviously, our kids are home now. If you can tell them, look, don't game for an hour or two, or don't download, don't do all the stuff that we know they all do. If you can ask them to do that to save the bandwidth for a video deposition, they are bandwidth hogs. Most of these um, video conferencing companies have, have worked around that and are very good allowing this, um, but still, the more bandwidth you can allow yourself and just have everybody else get off the internet would be great. Um, let's see where else we are. We talked about the dress, your framing, we talked about that. Kind of just try to get yourself so you're not way down here or something. Try to tell your witness when they are going to be joining us with a webcam. You know, they can put their laptop up on a book to get it a little higher. You know, the better, we, we still want to have a proper framing. So if they can work with that, that would be great. Uh, lighting, obviously, don't go right in front of a window because you're going to be blown out. You're going to see yourself in here, so you'll kind of know to adjust that. Um, what else? Obviously, distractions. If you have little kids or little dogs or anything that wants to come in and play with you while you're doing this, you need to remind them, and you may have to lock yourself in a room because just like us, everybody is a little you know, antsy and they want to see what you're doing and be part of it. But again, this is a legal deposition and we need to act just like we're in front of a judge and a jury during this procedure. So having your child come in saying, what are you making me for lunch? Is probably not the best idea. Um, let's see where else I am in here. 
So obviously we would love during a deposition for the court reporter and the videographer to be with the witness during that time. I'm not sure what the rules are and maybe Judge Engelhardt can clarify that. Some people are telling me that the legal is essential. Um, I, I'm not really sure where depositions would uh, stand in that. I don't really feel it's appropriate for the court reporter or the, the videographer at this time to go to the witness's house and do that. Obviously, that's the best thing, you know, in any situation when we're in a deposition, but we're not, this is a different world right now for us for at least the next couple weeks. So this is the next best thing. And I think if, like I said, if everybody's a little bit open about it and understanding, we can make this work. So one thing I do want to show you is you can see now there are many, there's a few different grids that you can make. If you're having a conference, we can all be on here at the same size. Um, I like it when it's a, when it's an actual deposition, I like the witness to be the big one. So today I'm going to play the witness. So one thing I want to show you, I know there are a lot of questions about if you can share an exhibit, how they're dealing with exhibits. Share my screen, I, what I'm going to do with you, and I think you can all see what I'm doing. I have my exhibits already preloaded in here. So I can pull up an exhibit. Everybody can see this. And that's not the one I wanted to pull up. Sorry, Renee. <laughs> I'm going to pull up a different exhibit. Let me see here. I'll pull up the judges. So I'm just going to, this would be an exhibit. So they could mark this exhibit. You could go over it. The witness has the ability to scroll through it if it's multiple pages. Once you've had him identify it and you decide to mark it as an exhibit, you can actually upload that, which we've uploaded it several times. You can upload that to the this little thing down here that says exhibits to one of the little pods. And the court reporter can download that right away. And you can see she, she can click download on that. She can download the file and then she has the file. So let me see, that's, that's with exhibits. That's super easy. The exhibits are super easy. We can bring in um, MP4 videos. You can do that. You have multiple share pods. We can change the size of these. We can take over. You're going to see a little bit in the other people's, um, how they, when they do their talks that we can make them big. So there are many different things you can do with this. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to talk to you guys today about is a mediation. If you're thinking about a mediation, and all of my speakers today have not had the opportunity to do this, so this is going to be a little new for them, but I'm going to show you how to do a breakout room. And so I am going to send Mr. Augusta to a breakout room one. Carolyn, I'm going to stick you with Mr. Augusta. Mr. Lawson, and just so you guys know that everybody out there is streaming can see what I'm doing. I'm not sure you guys can. Judge Engelhardt, I'm going to stick you in a breakout room. Renee, I'm going to put you in a breakout room. And I knew you were going to do this to me. Michael. I don't feel anything. I don't feel Sorry. any different. I know. Michael, I'm going to put you in a breakout room. Okay, so now we're, we're all still in the main room, but I have moved every, oh, let me see, Michael, I'm going to put you in a breakout room. Okay, we're all together still, and this would be something, if I were the mediator, I would have control. I'm the only one that can go from room to room. Everybody else, I put them in their breakout rooms, they are totally secure. When I go to the breakout room, is what I'm going to do, you will see that when they go into the breakout room, it is only the people named in their breakout rooms. It's going to look like this, and they will be able to share documents, talk to each other face to face. No one else will see that. So I'm actually going to go into breakout room one, and I'm going to enter us into breakout room one. I'm going to start my breakouts. Okay, so now I am in breakout one, room one, and I am with Mr. Augusta and with Caroline. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just doing this real quick to show you. I can also tell everybody else. I have the ability to broadcast. I can say I will be with you in a second if I can type properly. 
and then all the broadcast room, all the breakout rooms will get that. So I'm going to leave these guys, okay, and I'm going to move myself as the mediator to breakout room two. So now I'm with Judge Englehart and Mr. Lawson. And we can share screens. Anything we do in here, we can share. Everybody can share their documents. No one else will be able to view that. We can talk. We can do everything we, we want. And now I'm going to move myself one more time. And I'm going to go Sir. with Hello. Michael and Renee. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Hey. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to broadcast a message so everybody can see that and say I am going to be ending to get out of the broad get out of the breakout rooms. Sounds good. So no one could see or hear us during that time, but now I'm going to end our breakouts. And now we're all back together. Everybody, hi everyone. Everyone's back in. Okay? So I think that's really important for mediations. We could also do that in a deposition if we decided to take a short break and one of our one of the attorneys wanted to talk to his client or show him a new document we could make that breakout room and we can easily set it up just like you saw me do that was totally new with everybody on here today we had not practiced that or i had not shown them that also a few other things is there's a chat i can add multiple windows down here to do multiple things multiple exhibits multiple share screens so it was pretty easy i think all these guys can attest to it when they take their turn getting in and um, downloading just like any of the software or any of the video conferencing apps you would want to download uh, the application that's pretty easy so what I'm going to do Benny is I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Benny Augusta and let him go from here thank you guys thank you very much uh, Beth we have a few minutes I'm going to be able to share with you I wanted again Thank you, Beth, and BWA Video for your help and services here. Uh, Cody, one of your folks, is here with us. I want to thank him, too. Uh, I want to remind everyone who's watching that you are able to get 1.5 hours of CLE by observing this video, uh, 0.25 of credit hours, 0.25 for ethics. Uh, and with that in mind, I want to make sure and remind everybody that uh, we have studied this with our ethical professionals and reminding everyone that it is our duty as lawyers to continue to communicate with our clients. And the best way to do it is by using these video streaming or video uh, chat rooms. It gives us an opportunity to continue to, to communicate even when we are under this stay home, stay home order. So, uh, what do we do here when we do these video opportunities? Let's go back to the normal. In the olden days, we used to have a court reporter that would work on handwritten uh, shorthand or moving forward in a machine, using a machine where you couldn't read anything. It was shorthand, electronic shorthand. And then we have moved forward now, uh, before these issues that we're dealing with, we've moved forward to the fact that we have almost every deposition that we take is by court reporter and video. Because as you remember, we used to have to, when we went to trial, I had to read the transcript and we would have to bring folks to help us read in front of the jury the transcripts that we wanted the witnesses testimony in front of the jury. So it would be painstaking uh, opportunity for us all to actually have to read the transcript, question and answer, and when, when I remember doing it all by myself, I would read the question and the answer and have to uh, try to do it in such a way that the jury followed what I was doing. But the normal has been that we take videos, deposition, depositions by court reporter and videos, and then we use that then to prepare for trial or prepare the case for a jury. Uh, of course, we have had many opportunities recently where as technology has evolved, we can have chat rooms, or meetings with our clients or with our experts where the experts are able to put the documents in front of us and we have discussions with the experts in these chat rooms and we can go over the different evidence or testimony or documents that we need to to prepare for a deposition. 
So that's been our normal as we have evolved through the legal times. What is our new normal is what we have now. And unfortunately, this COVID-19 has forced us all, lawyers in the greater Houston area and the legal departments of the greater Houston area to adapt to this new normal. So because we are under these stay home orders from the governor and the county judge and the local rules as the judge, judges of the criminal and civil courts have tried to apply them, we now have to deal with this uh, online presentation of depositions or meetings, which I think help us overall to become better lawyers. We have to use this system to maintain social distancing. Obviously, it's for our health, our medical health and our body and mind health that we stay away from each other so we don't continue to get folks sick or, or contract the virus ourselves. So maintaining social distance is super important. Reduce, it'll help us reduce travel time and expenses. If you think about it, if I had to take a deposition of a witness who's in California, uh, most of us normally would get on a plane, go over there, get prepared, stay in a hotel, and bring your staff or uh, the video equipment and court reporter uh, folks together, and then we do the deposition. Now, because of the new normal, because we're forced to do it this way, we've had to, we're going to be able to reduce time and expense money in getting these depositions done. Uh, it may be that the new normal allows us to learn to do this in such a way that we don't always have to travel across country to do it. Uh, whether it's Dallas, San Antonio, California, or New York, either way, we can still do it this way. And it's gonna be to the benefit of all of our lawyers and ultimately our clients, because if we're gonna save money, I think the clients will really, really appreciate that. One thing that's important about these video depositions or video conferencing, particularly depositions, is that we can view these recordings over and over. Remember that the normal has been to take depositions and record them. So 100% of my cases, we take a deposition, we have a video also of that deposition. So the clients can review it, we can review it. When we get ready for mediation or special hearings or even trial, we can do depot cuts or video cuts. So when I present a short summary of the testimony, I can do it via video. Well, not everybody is using that system, even though in our practice it's been normal. What has happened now is that this forces us to have these videos and maybe improve our practice so we can get into the depot cuts and the recording of our depositions in some important meetings. So it's gonna help us in many ways. It's gonna help us in the ways that we save money and expenses, save uh, costs for our clients, and ultimately it's gonna get us better prepared for these hearings and these trials as they come up. And lastly, I think that when it comes to our progress and our ability to continue to communicate, remember it's important we communicate with our clients, but not just with our clients. A lot of us are using uh, stay home offices. A lot of folks are working online and, and staying at home. And so when you have an office where sometimes you have to meet face to face or you have to have interaction with your team or staff, it's best to have these video conferencing for meetings with your staff. And well, you can do a conference call and you can do a phone call, but when it comes to checking up on each other and as it regards to the wellness of us as lawyers and as legal departments, it's best to have an opportunity, even if it's once a week, to sit down and interact with your team and have a face-to-face -face meeting. It'll definitely get us all in a better position and posture to work together, taking care of each other. So now, in my last few minutes, I wanted to now shift gears a little bit and talk about the what I was working with the Houston Bar team and the CLE team, which ultimately led to having this conference put together. I thought it's important as trial lawyers that we talk about the survival guide to being a trial lawyer in this day and age. We're so used to going to the courthouse and having a face-to-face -face meeting with the judge or having depositions face-to-face. -face. It's become difficult for us that are not used to the technology to come up to that par level and to get used to it. I will tell you that this week alone, uh, my law firm and me were involved in a chemical plant fire case with multiple injuries with multiple law firms uh, taking depositions this week via this same process. And we did it, we had three full days of depositions and we had several hearings in between time to get ready for that and get the court to order some of this uh, to take place but we actually did it with documents, exhibits, witnesses, and lawyers making all kinds of objections and questions
to try to get our work continuing. And ultimately, we did it through Court Reporter, through video recording, so we have it all taped. And as it relates to what we're doing here today, we have all the lawyers, almost 20 lawyers and participants that were listening in via online video or calling in through the phone line so that you can be on mute listening in and when you wanted to say something or it was your turn to ask questions, you unmuted yourself and get, got into the system and asked questions. So that happened this week in Houston, Texas, in our law firm and many other law firms across the city. So it's important that we deal with some of these things. So let me give you my last comments and, and highlight this. When we're covering hearings, uh, which is something that all lawyers have to do, the courts have been gracious enough to allow phone calls, which we've been doing for many years, but now we have to do them more often. When, when we can't submit documents on submission or motions on submission, which the court now is taking as a matter of norm, and it's something that you have to ask for a hearing or an emergency hearing, the courts will listen to you, they will take that to the judge, and then the judge will call for a hearing. And all you have to do is get a call-in number, work with the court staff to get that number set up, and have call-in hearings. So now we have to do that all the time, because whether there's a motion to compel, or a motion for protection, or a motion for clarity, we need to understand what the court is asking us to do. And with the COVID-19 uh, stay home orders. We were a little concerned as to how we were going to proceed. And so luckily we were able to talk to folks in the county judges uh, chambers and, and negotiate the Houston Bar Association and the State Bar of Texas and many other legal departments, including Vince Ryan and his Harris County office, legal office. We were able to negotiate that for essential businesses, which is one of the exclusions to the order, professional services applied and by having professional services apply to that exclusion, so to speak, under essential businesses, lawyers or providers uh, of necessary services to maintain and assist in legal, the legal mandates and activities of the county are excluded. So that allowed us lawyers to continue to work, sometimes leaving the house to go check your mail, pick up checks, deliver checks, uh, pay bills, different ways that you have to go out and back to the office when you can't stay at home. That allowed us to continue uh, the work. So when you have hearings, of course, the court is doing it via teleconference. Uh, you have to now file motions to continue. You have to be heard on those. You have to file a motion to uh, adapt the DCOs or the MDL managing control plans, or even trial dates. I see a lot of lawyers are filing motions to get these specific dates uh, changed or adapted and if you do it through rule 11 of course the judges will appreciate it but if you have to be heard then of course that's how you go about it now real quickly when it comes to depositions we have talked a little bit about how to do it uh, the best way i recommend is that you ahead of time plan a lot of us would show up at a deposition have your box with documents and start pulling them out well this is a little more complicated now you can still do it on the computer but in complex cases, it's best to get the court reporter and the court videographer, the videographer and the reporter, to have the documents downloaded by Bates number. So when we are able then to get that as exhibit one, I would say uh, pages one through 10 of, of the Bates number, and let's make that exhibit one. And we mark it and put it in the program like we showed earlier as an exhibit. Then you can zoom in you can highlight, you can circle in red, you can do whatever you want technologically with the computer once the document is in front of the witness, and then you take the witness through the documents to try to get the answers, question and answers, the best way you can. You can put pictures of there, up there, you can put video clips if necessary. If the case has advanced quite a bit and you wanna show the deposition clip of some other witness, you can put it on there, the witness who you're asking questions will listen and then follow up with follow-up questions. So there's a lot of ways that technology will allow us to make this video deposition the best it can be getting ready for trial. It's gonna take a little practice and a little work, but we can do it. Now, in closing, I wanna remind you, because there's other people we wanna hear from, that mediation, settlement negotiations, meetings with your clients and with your legal department in your firm or your team all can remain if you're able to do these meetings online. 
You can keep on pushing the case. We have depositions and mediations scheduled the whole month of March and the whole month of April. And on rare occasions, we've had the judge, we've had hearings for protection, and the judges have said, listen, we don't want to halt the legal services that are occurring in this greater city of Houston, greater Houston area. What we need to do is be conscious that if people cannot show up live to a conference room or because of their circumstances, elderly or compromised health, they can't have a person in their office or home with a videographer or a court reporter, we may stall those depositions and push them back. But generally, the way we're doing it now, it's quite safe. We are watchful of everyone's health and the social distancing. And ultimately, the goal is to continue to push, to keep on getting our clients well represented, get ready for depositions or trial. And if the cases are, are ready to settle, then you can do that. But otherwise, if we don't push, we won't be ready for trial, and we won't be able to bring justice to our clients. So on behalf of the Houston Bar Association and my firm, I thank you personally for this time. Now, my next, uh, I'll introduce the Honorable Mike Engelhart. He is a judge of the 151st Judicial District Court. We appreciate his time, Judge. Uh, you've been a, a leader, not only in technology, but leader keeping us working. I want to thank you for your time here today, and I want you to uh, give us what's happening in the court system and in judiciary as we deal with COVID-19. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you, Benny. It's always nice to be with you and uh, to Beth and everybody else, all the other presenters and our attendees. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here with you and have this opportunity to speak about things that are happening in Harris County. Uh, we've gone through a lot of changes in the last few weeks. I finished a trial a couple of weeks ago on a Friday, and that was the last jury that I'm probably going to have through the, at least the middle of May. Um, there are th changes at the physical courthouse. There's changes within the district clerk's office, our staffing. Uh, where they are located, what they're doing, what the expectations of their work are. Uh, so I, I thought I would talk about some of those things in case some of our attendees are not aware of some of the things that we've been doing because that's the insight that I have. As a, I've been a judge for over 11 years, so I haven't taken a deposition in that time. Uh, so what I, I, I'm going to defer to our court reporters who are here and other attendees and, and uh, Benny to talk about those things in more detail, although at the end of my presentation, I want to share with you an order that I have entered, a new standing order for the 151st District Court, and I think a lot of other judges will be entering similar orders about, uh, how to, uh, about changes to our deposition rules. So uh, we've gotten a lot of guidance as a result of this pandemic from the Texas Supreme Court and the OCA, the Office of Court Administration, about how we are to proceed and how certain rules are to change and, and, and to be relaxed. Um, one of the things that uh, has happened within the district clerk's office is that we are, in tandem with that, is that our clerks are no longer physically in the building. Uh, for the most part, they are working from home. They've been given the technology, the computers uh, they need and are working with, between their cell phones and their computers. They have access to the district clerk system to work on our dockets, and most of the judges are working at home, if not all of them, are working at home on their dockets. We have access the same way remotely to our desktops and are working on working up orders on our submission dockets, on what we call our uncontested dockets. If there's agreed continuances or other agreed judgments or other things like that, we're able to sign them, just like we always have. And we are now handling our dockets remotely. Uh, last Monday, I was in the courtroom and did video conference deposition, excuse me, video conference hearings and phone hearings, a number of them. And while there's a learning curve and they were not perfect, we did we got through them. Um, and I think as we proceed, the judges will also get up to speed and get better at uh, sharing and looking at documents. But we have access to deeds. We have access to our dockets to see the documents you've already filed, um, and hopefully we'll have prepared for those hearings, as I always do, ahead of time, uh, so we're familiar with the documents in the case, or if we need to uh, go through the file and find a document that you're referring to, we we're able to do that, like we had in the past. So that's not a huge change for us. Uh, adapting to the video conference.
conferencing software and its capabilities, uh, learning to use the breakout rooms, the waiting rooms, uh, the document presentation and sharing capabilities are things that we'll learn over time because I was not, so that was not something that I used that often, uh, but now we have the uh, capability of doing that. One good thing is that uh, for our hearings, we have, let me see if I can share with you on my screen our, um, oh, let's see. Beth, are you able to put up the, uh, the PDF of our, our web, our JustX webpage? She had it ready. Um, yes. There is a link in the web link to her. On the yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. All right. So I hope you can all see that. And if you go to www.justx.net to our uh, to the, the district clerk's um, the district court's web page, and then you click on oh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you click on courts over here on the left. And then it'll pull up uh, civil, criminal, juvenile, family. You click on civil, and then you click on our court. Um, and then you'll scroll down in, on our page to our docket page, or our updated docket. And you'll see there's a number of things there, and I'll let Carolyn talk about a number of them. But um, we post our docket here. And so this you're looking, you can see our uh, mon next Monday, March 30th, oral hearing docket. Now a number of these items have already passed, but we're doing them by video conference. Now not everybody has to come in and appear by video. When you use that particular application, it also allows you to phone in or, or use the audio only, and that's perfectly fine, and we're happy with that. But if you want to appear uh, on the video screen, you can do that as well. And we, on the right side, you see we include all the meeting ID links. And then one thing that OCA has done for us is initially we had just free versions of this particular application. Uh, but OCA has allowed us through our justtext.net email addresses, those accounts to, become, to actually have professional or licensed versions of the application. And um, now we're, there's no time limit on our meetings because initially on the free version there's only a 40 minute limit. Now there are uh, no limits. Uh, on the time, I guess we could have a perpetual meeting, theoretically. Um, and they have uh, shown us how, and we have learned how to, or at least some of us have learned how to live stream these video hearings to YouTube. And so if you go to YouTube and you search for 151st Civil District Court Harris County, you should find my smiling face in my robe as the avatar. and on a Monday, all of these oral hearings will be live streamed to YouTube and you can watch them, you the public can watch them part, uh, right there and see them. They won't stay there, uh, but you can view them live as they're happening. Uh, so the, I want to thank the folks in Austin for uh, helping us work through some of these issues and creating those capabilities for us. I think that'll be one of uh, we've had a lot of meetings as judges, uh, the big board of judges, all the district, the uh, 60 something district court judges of the, of, in the different divisions and then also within the civil district courts. And a lot of the time that we've been spending, aside from working with litigators, is following the requirements of the Texas Constitution open courts provision uh, and making sure that the public has the same or at least reasonably similar access that they've had in the past to our courts. If anyone wanted to wander down to the courthouse and sit in the courtroom and watch the proceedings, that's the essence of the open courts provision. Now they have to do that virtually. They can do it on YouTube or they can even participate in our uh, Zoom uh, video hearings. Of course, they should be on mute because just like the public in the courtroom, we don't expect them to participate in the actual hearing, but they're certainly welcome to observe. We also have the ability, if they become disruptive, to uh, exclude them, or just like we do have a bailiff in the courtroom, or we can uh, mute them or um, put them back in the waiting room. So that's how we're doing our dockets, and those are some of the changes that uh, we have, and uh, folks need to have the appropriate application to be able to participate in those. 
in, in those proceedings, but uh, that shouldn't be a big chore for most lawyers. Um, let's see. And I want to tell you, I want to give you some peace of mind that this is new for most of the judges. It is a new era. We are all doing the best we can, I promise you. Uh, we're all very, in my day-to-day -day conversations with other judges as groups and individuals, we're all working through these things with, in good faith. And we all understand that this is new and difficult for everybody. And so you, I want to echo Benny's sentiments uh, and Beth's sentiments about being kind and patient and thoughtful, uh, being resourceful, all of the Boy Scout things, resourceful and uh, et cetera, because it is, we need to get through this as a bar together. The public is counting on us. The government is counting on us. All these businesses and, and folks are counting on us to continue to do our jobs, but also to uh, realize that there is, uh, that the, the wellness and sanity of the lawyers and participants and litigators and court reporters uh, is important as well so that when we come out of the other side of this, not only will we all be functioning, but perhaps we'll even be closer and better um, and, uh, and more technologically skilled, of course, than we were before going into this. So we can make the best of it, but the and I'm sure you that the judges are, are being patient and doing our very best to be responsive to the needs of the bar as this proceeds. Um, the, the, thing, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is, um, is now is uh, deposition. So if we can put up the, Beth, if you would put up the order that I have signed, because when I go to share my screen, it's, uh, nothing is recently shared. So if you can pull, the, pull that up for me, pull I would appreciate it. it. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, give me one second. No problem. She had it. I have it. I just have to pull it up. Okay. There you go. So, and just so for your peace of mind, my son is on the other side of my computer screen was asking me a question while we were doing this. And we're certainly aware that there's going to be distractions working at home. Uh, your cat is going to knock over the lamp. The mail is going to come through the mail slot behind me in a little while. Um, it's cool. Don't worry about it. Just maintain decorum. Make sure you're dressed and, and uh, appropriately and uh, for the proceedings. And remember, it is to try to treat it like a courtroom, or if it's a deposition, try to treat it like a formal deposition. Don't show up um, in a in an offensive T-shirt, for example. Uh, but try to maintain that, uh, that sense of decorum uh, because the more normalcy we can bring to all of these proceedings, the better we'll do. So there was, a, there was concern that we that filtered through to the judges uh, with, about 10 days ago, a week or 10 days ago, about people moving to quash depositions, or litigants moving to quash depositions on the sole basis that they were being done by video conference and the lawyer, lawyer or lawyers, or perhaps even the court reporter, wanted to attend in person. Well, with our new era of social distancing, that's a problem. Um, and so we took, some of us have taken, and more of us will soon, soon take, I believe, the step of first looking at the emergency orders that came from the Texas Supreme Court. And that order, those orders told us to relax deadlines, and relax those types of rules and procedures that we can uh, that will allow us to, that will allow the parties to maintain that important social distancing, but also continue to function as a bar and as a court system. And so one of the, and so and, uh, courts in Wessex County and I think in Dallas County started entering these orders. And so we have, some of us have followed that lead. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger if you can read it. But in light of the rules being uh, relaxed for the purposes of this pandemic, the 151st District Court has entered a new standing order as it relates to oral depositions that they may be done remotely and all of the parties can be in different places 
that a motion to quash that is based solely on the fact that it's being done remotely and the part and the attorney can't be in the same room with the witness, etc., uh, is not going to be a motion to quash that will be that has merit and will not be granted. Now, if you still have other quashing motion to quash issues under Rule 199.4, then of course we can consider those t uh, date or or time things like that because on. Though we are in a new era of having to do things remotely, we're also in a new era where people don't have, their kids aren't in school. And so people might have young kids and they might have time uh, crunches. They might have elderly parents that they're trying to take care of that they're, they wouldn't have been in, in that position to do otherwise. We understand that. And so there may be other reasons to quash depositions and we'll, those are still valid and, and may be considered. The point of this order is if your motion to quash is based solely on the fact that it's the video, the deposition is being done by video and remotely, uh, that's not going to be a good motion to quash. Um, now, one of the things that I think Beth asked about and I wanted to answer in subpart five, paragraph five of the order, it says the witness may be placed under oath remotely and the person administering the oath need not be present with the witness. The person administering the oath must be authorized to administer oaths in their own jurisdiction. So my read, my understanding of that is that that is the court reporter who typically is the one who swears, as you know, swears in the witness. And the court reporter and the witness by this order do not need to be in the same room or the same building uh, as long, but they may be, the witness may be sworn in remotely. And then the order goes on to say that um, this deposition that's done remotely will may be or can be considered as evidence and I would tell you that it's probably likely to be considered as evidence just like any other deposition but if there is some good reason to opt out of this order or if the deposition is otherwise not trustworthy because of some, maybe some technological issue or other issues that you want to bring to the court's attention as we get closer to trial and we come out of the other side of this crisis I'm sure courts will be at least somewhat amenable to discussing those issues with you if you have a novel or interest or, or unique um, or, or, or serious technical or legal issue to bring to the court's attention. The idea behind this order and other orders that I believe will be forthcoming uh, from the courts is to head off a plethora of motions to quash that are based solely on this issue and to solve this issue as we are allowed to do under the Supreme Court's emergency orders before it becomes, uh, it, it grinds the litigation process to a halt. Finally, I want to say I'm probably out of time. Um, when you're in those depositions, remember to, uh, one thing that came up in our video hearings is people are not muting themselves. It's important to remember to mute yourself just for the sound quality and, uh, and also in embarrassing things that might be happening in your end. Uh, you don't want people to hear. Uh, it just makes for a better it makes it easier for people to understand and then uh, court reporters I'm sure will have to be patient and, and understanding and as we all will when people start talking and they're muted and then they have to remember to unmute themselves and there's some crosstalk uh, we'll just have to do the best we can and go slowly and um, and be sensitive to the court reporters needs because ultimately as I always say in normal proceedings the most important person in the room is the court reporter uh, because they're the ones that are taking down the record and uh, if we don't know what was done at the deposition or don't know what was done in the hearing we might not we might as well not have been there in the first place um, so thanks for inviting me to be part of this this may be the new normal I, I have a feeling that these technological changes that we're going through are going to stay with us for a long long time and can if we're if we are conscientious about it and we all take the time to learn these things can actually improve our practice as lawyers and judges going forward. So um, thank you again for inviting me. I'm proud to be a part of this presentation. I will tell you that the judiciary in Harris County is aware of these issues, is working hard behind the scenes on these issues to make, uh, to streamline as many of these things as we possibly can to allow the business of litigation to continue. Thank you, Judge. Um, I just, before we introduce our next speaker, I just want to mention that I know a lot of you have questions on the stream. 
And we are going to, when we finish up, I'm going to scroll through, grab a few. I know there are many for you, Judge. So, um, but we'll scroll through and grab a few of these. If we don't get to your question, the judge will certainly, and Mr. Augusta will certainly have these, and they can look over them, and they can answer these, which will be posted. Okay? And so our next speaker is Renee. Yeah, thank you. I'd be glad to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Renee Morifi, Morifi? I know I messed that up, but I'm going to... Um, She's our next speaker, and she is a court reporter here in Houston, and she's going to give us some information on that. And Beth, are you going to get my PowerPoint ready for me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. While she's doing that, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Renee Moreffi. I'm a certified court reporter and have been for 34 years. I am the past president of the Houston Court Reporters Association, and I'm currently the treasurer for the Texas Deposition Reporters Association. And so I've prepared a PowerPoint to uh, be able to share some thoughts regarding remote depositions. And we'll it's going to come up here in one second, guys. Again, this is what happens, and this is what we all have to be patient with in the real world, too, is that it's just going to take a, a minute or two to pull in. Something happened where it all, all of our documents disappeared, so I'm having to bring them back in. But that is something that everybody needs to understand. Um, patience, patience, patience. We're all learning that. So this should take probably about another 30 or 40 seconds. So Renee, if you wanted to bring anything else up before this gets on. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not good at ex extemporaneous speaking. <laughs> uh, I will say that some of the, the prior speakers have covered a lot of what I'll be talking about, but um, I'm just going to really be talking about it from the court reporter's perspective. So hopefully that'll answer some questions that some of you may have. Okay, there you go. Also, I wanted, Renee, before you go on, I wanted to make sure everyone can see that um, this has made the screen large. So, and although, um, that, you, Renee is still, she's going to talk over this, but you can also do this with your exhibits. Okay. All right. So I've already introduced myself, so we'll just get started. Um, sound is everything. If we can't hear you, we can't take it down, literally. Most applications allow for attending via audio and video. It is highly recommended that you use your computer or other device to connect uh, for the video and call in with your phone with the audio. It produces a much better sound and reduces the bandwidth needed. That is important now because everyone in every industry is working remotely and using valuable, much needed bandwidth. You will obviously need to use a speakerphone or a headset with a built-in microphone. Even though other attendees can see you, you're not being videotaped, so don't worry about it, what, what it looks like. And, you know, we've already talked about backgrounds and appearances, and uh, don't worry about things like that. Um, if you do choose to use a speakerphone and you're using your smartphone um, <clears throat> while you're at home, please consider purchasing a Bluetooth wireless speaker with a built-in mic. The sound is superior to just talking through your phone speaker. There are several options uh, out there, and for example, the Bose and Jabra are fine examples, and you could also use your AirPods. The only thing you need to remember is whatever you're using, you need to make sure it can stay charged all day. You know, a hearing in court may last 30 minutes, but our depositions can sometimes go all day long. So make sure that everything is plugged in and charged and stays charged. Uh, make sure to have the speakers on your computer muted, especially if you're dialing in with your phone. You will get a lot of feedback if you don't. Uh, you also want to have your phone muted if you're not the one asking the questions because while things are going on, you may be rustling papers or you may be typing on your computer. And if you do that, everybody's going to hear it and it could even drown out uh, somebody else's voice. So we have to be more mindful with that while we're doing these remotely. Um, 
also with uh, as been has previously been stated you know we are most of us are at home right now and so we may have kids or dogs or in my case cats meowing in the background you want to try to reduce that as much as possible and staying muted will certainly help with that uh, the remote exhibits have been touched on already um, just a few comments on that um, you do want to plan ahead, obviously, and most of you already know before you start your deposition what exhibits you're going to want to use, but you will need to get them scanned in and get them to the court reporter. If you are uh, able to go ahead and pre-mark the exhibits, that is extremely helpful to everybody. It helps the reporter identify what the exhibit is. Um, if they're not pre-marked, uh, definitely make sure that the reporter has them ahead of time and you just have to figure out during the deposition if you want the reporter to publish the exhibits or you do it on your end, um, but you need to give whoever is handling that time to find the exhibits and publish them and maybe even rename the file so they can be tracked later. And everybody should agree that whatever exhibits the reporter has at the end of the day will become the official set and the reporter will print out a hard copy and those will be the official exhibits. Um, when you log into a remote session, when you're prompted to enter your name, please fill in your full name. The reporter will use this to more easily identify you when you're speaking. This can reduce the number of times the reporter may need to stop for clarification. We all know the instruction given to witnesses about not talking at the same time and not interrupting. This is extremely crucial in a remote setting, and many times when two people speak simultaneously in a remote setting, one voice is completely lost and the words are gone forever. Be patient when the court reporter interrupts during these times. He or she is merely trying to protect your record. There will likely be a request for something to be repeated. It's just the nature of the beast. The reporter should verify a witness's identity prior to beginning the deposition by either asking to see a driver's license or having counsel confirm the witness's identity. The reporter will then likely read a statement into the record re referring to the first emergency order regarding the COVID-19 state of disaster, paragraphs 2B and C. This is what allows the reporter to swear the witness in remotely. And as a side comment, Texas Certified Shorthand Reporters, we have the authority with our CSR to swear in uh, witnesses throughout the state. It's not limited to where we are located or where the witness is located. Um, and before the witness is sworn in, the reporter will very likely ask everyone to present themselves, uh, present to identify themselves, please remember to speak one at a time. We'll be taking that down on the record so that we capture all of those attending. And then Renee? the will then just proceed the way depositions normally do, uh, just with the slight modification that it's remote. Um, check your surroundings. We've all talked about this a little bit already. If you're attending from home, if you can find a quiet place with good lighting where you won't be interrupted and check in and check what is behind you. If you could sit facing a window, you'll get better light. Um, remember, everyone can see, you know, what your camera is looking at and that's another reason to think about how you're dressed even like during breaks if you get up that camera is still you know showing what's in your room some applications allow you to use a virtual background if you can use that that helps if you have uh, an area that is maybe a little cluttered then a virtual background will help cover that up Last but not least, please test attending a remote deposition before the deposition. Don't wait until the day of the deposition to try out any of these applications. Um, court reporting firms around the Houston area have been ramping up and getting prepared for remote depositions and have been training their court reporters. They would prefer to be the ones they would prefer to be the one setting up the video conference session so you don't have to worry about learning how to do that. 
and they are more than happy to do a test run and will help you work out the kinks. Thank you very much for inviting us to participate in this discussion, and the court reporters in Houston are looking forward to seeing all of you remotely. And I don't know if there are any questions, if we're going to wait till the end. I think Beth uh, mentioned that. I'm sorry, Judge. Go ahead. I think you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I'm muted. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to say in conjunction with what um, Renee was saying about the using the dep taking the remote deposition, our order, so if your case is in our court, uh, our order requires that you attach a copy of the order to your deposition notice. It's down there in the last one of the last couple of paragraphs in the order. And I think when other similar orders are signed by courts, uh, they will probably have that same language in there. So grab a copy of that order, keep it handy uh, as a PDF, and attach it to your deposition notices. Thank you, Judge. So the next we have, we have Carolyn Coronado. Coronado. I think I even said your name right. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Hello, I'm Carolyn Coronado. I am the official court reporter for Judge Mike Englehart of the 151st Civil District Court. And Beth, if you want to get the um, link up to our website or either the snapshot that you took, that would be great. So I don't know how long that's going to take to come up. But <clears throat> I've been reporting for, I think, 23 years now. <laughs> and I've been working with Judge Englehart for about 12 years as an official and civil, but I've worked in all the courts. I'm also the president of our newly formed Harris County Official Court Reporters Association, and that is recognized by our county commissioners and judges here in Harris County. So I just wanted to, um, I concur with everything Renee has said uh, so far about how to um, handle reporting remotely and you know depositions. Same would hold true for the courts. I uh, just want to let everyone know that the official court reporters are all on top of this. They've all been training with Zoom, and um, so we're all practicing. Some of us have already taken some hearings via Zoom, so uh, we are on top of it. And so if you all have any questions, feel free to contact us. You can contact each court reporter uh, by going to their website, their court's website, and most court reporters have their phones forwarded to their mobile phone so that you can get a hold of us quicker. Um, so feel free to contact us there, or you can also contact our association. It's just hcocra at gmail.com, and if you, there's anything y'all need to get to us that we can disseminate information out to all the official court reporters, we're happy to do that. So um, I just wanted to go over and piggyback off a little bit of what Renee said. Um, basically, you can find all of this information. It's all pretty much common sense, but you can find the court decorum right here. This would probably apply for all courts, but let me see. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Because my eyesight's bad. <laughs> so just, you know, touch up again, dress appropriately, be on time for your hearing, be mindful of the estimated time that you've given the courts for your hearing, be mindful of background noise, mute your button when you are not speaking, refrain from using the speaker phone on your mobile phone because that gets um, a little difficult to understand sometimes. Uh, wait until the court calls your case. Speak loud, clearly, and slowly, always. I know it's hard to remember to do that, but we'll remind you. Um, identify yourself and who you represent before a hearing begins to both the judge and the court reporter. If someone is speaking, do not interrupt them. Identify yourself each time you speak. That's if you're on the phone and you're not on video. Sometimes some attorneys sound the same and we don't know who's speaking and they'll forget. So we may have to chime in and say, excuse me, who's speaking? Please you know, state your name. I, let's see, display your name on your video chat profile. There's a way for you to do that in Zoom. I'm sure in this application as well. And then, um, let's see, test your speakerphone and microphone before joining the meeting. In Zoom, you can do that, and we've set the link out here on our website, well, the judge's website, <laughs> um, on how to do that. It's very easy. And recording is prohibited, subject to contempt if violated. So although these 
will be displayed, all the hearings will be displayed on YouTube. They're not going to be recorded and put up there for anyone to view later. It's just like coming in court. You come in court, have your hearing, you leave. There's no recording of that So uh, to go back and watch later. So same will still apply. And then we have, um, let's see what else is on here. Advise the court before a hearing if a record is um, is being requested, you want a reporter's record, go ahead and let the clerk know that or the coordinator. Or you can just contact the court reporter directly and let give us a heads up that you're going to want a record. But we're all going to be set up ready to go anyway. Um, let's see. And then here are some links here on our website. My contact information is here, uh, Carolyn Coronado at justtech.net. And then there's my phone number. And then there is, uh, before joining the meeting, here's the system requirements. Make sure you have your system requirements. And uh, you can click on these different uh, links here to help you with Zoom. And there's some Zoom tutorials that you can watch. And let's see, uh, just want to let everyone know that the official court reporters are ready to go. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you Mary, very much, Carolyn, and I didn't mean to do that. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Lawson, and I'm going to make you big and let you go. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank the Houston Bar Association for including us in today's program. Uh, the Law Library, of course, uh, has been impacted by the pandemic um, prior to uh, uh, prior to the uh, county's stay home, work safe order, uh, you know, we would see up to 300 people per day in the law library. Um, and so that made it a place that uh, social distancing uh, was a little bit difficult. And so our downtown location is uh, closed to the public. However, the law librarians at the Harris County Law Library are still uh, working remotely and uh, our goal is to try and make resources available to folks uh, who are now adjusting to uh, to working remotely and working from home. Uh, so uh, Beth gets uh, Beth gets this up here. Do I need to do something Beth? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Now which document was it? It's the Harris County Law Library Video Conferencing Resource Guide. There you go. There it is. So one of the ways that we want to make sure that the uh, information is available to you is by uh, putting together resource guides like this. Of course, the, the topic of today is video conferencing. Um, and so for uh, today's program, but also in an effort to support um, the ongoing resource or accessing these resources uh, we want to make sure that this is available to you so it's also on our website. Oh. Oh. We don't want that. You have to click out of there. <laughs> all right. It's all right. Not quite sure what we did here. Sorry, okay. Uh, I don't know if everybody's seeing this but all I'm seeing is our list of speakers here. There <laughs> ah, you here go. Excellent. Um, so one of the reasons why this is very important, um, if anybody is, is a, a consumer of the ABA's annual tech report, there's always a section on um, uh, whether or not attorneys have uh, feel as if they have enough training opportunities to meet technological, technological requirements in today's practice. And there's a bit of a disparity. So if, if you look at it broken down by firm size, uh, attorneys at larger firms tend to report that they have uh, training opportunities. If we look at the other end of the spectrum, solo and small firm attorneys, uh, it's closer to 25% say that they have uh, training opportunities. And so we want to make sure that resources like this are available to everyone so that the entire bar can, can keep functioning and representing all of the different clients who, who are out there. So the first thing that we have on here are uh, video conference platforms. Of course, uh, Zoom is uh, uh, kind of at the forefront at the moment because um, as the courts are 
implementing that at the video conferencing uh, platform. So uh, what I've listed here is both the main website but also the support website. Uh, one of the great things about all of these video conferencing corporations is that they have entire teams of people producing videos constantly and so they have excellent libraries of uh, training videos and support videos and that sort of thing and, and on each of these websites you can find that uh, through the support link or going directly to uh, to the URL for support that's or support depending on Joe Yes. We're having a little bit of an issue with your audio. Can you get a little closer to your big microphone? Oh, sure, sure. Can you hear me a little better now? Much better. Okay, sounds great. I'll, I'll just lean in a bit. Um, additionally, uh, you know, you might you might look at the differences in pricing depending on each platform. Um, that's just to make the note that each platform has a variety of pricing mechanisms from free up to enterprise if, if you have a larger organization. Uh, just to make a note, usually the free options um, are a little bit less secured. So if you're thinking of uh, things in terms of uh, ethical requirements of your cloud-based uh, resources, you may want to take a look at how for instance, uh, if you use the free version of Google Hangouts that's just tied to your, your Gmail account, you'll, you may want to take a look at the licensing terms and um, uh, make sure that uh, it's, it's treating the information in a way that you can comply with all of your confidentiality requirements and that sort of thing. Um, additionally, uh, we've put together a number of articles and guides on the other side of this resource guide. Uh, top there is web page from the Texas Judicial Branch, so uh, txcourts.gov. Uh, this one is being assembled by the Office of Court Administration. And it's Joe, a great guide to... You, you, we're that? having a little bit a little bit of an issue still, right. so you need to... There you go. How about if I move my microphone Perfect. right in front of me here? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yep. Wonderful. Okay. All right, so what we've discovered today is that Adobe Connect does not like blue microphones. So if anybody hey. can use that tip. <laughs> uh, I was on a go-to webinar earlier that's part of GoToMeeting. They love blue microphones. So, you know, just depending on, on which platform you're using, your hardware may, uh, may require, may have different requirements. So I'll throw that out there since, <laughs> since we're all working through the issues here. Um, and so I, I recommend everybody take a look at the, uh, the link from txcourts.gov just to make sure that uh, you have access to that. Uh, the Office of Court Administration has put together links to training videos from Zoom on things like how to join a Zoom meeting, how to start a Zoom meeting, how to go into a breakout room, all those sorts of things. So uh, that's an excellent resource for you. The next two are a pair of blog posts that have appeared on the Texas Bar blog uh, recently. Uh, Sally Pretorius uh, just wrote an excellent article about uh, dipping a toe into Zoom, which, which we now all have to do to a certain extent, and uh, taking advantage of all the functions there. Um, and then Craig Ball um, disappeared on the Texas Bar blog, but it was a reprint from his post on his blog, Ball in Your Court, and uh, he actually provides a cheat sheet of uh, keyboard hotkey uh, commands that you can use in Zoom to do things like mute certain groups and, and complete other functions like that. Um, uh, a law librarian over on the East Coast actually put together a step-by-step -step article on how to use Zoom, and it's got screenshots and that sort of thing. So uh, that's my colleague, Artie Burns, uh, put together a little link there. Um, if anybody uh, was reading ABA Journal in July of last year, uh, Nicole Black put together an excellent article on um, the encryption of each different type of platform and whether or not uh, it complies with various ethical requirements. And so if, if that's a concern of yours, I'm sure you read that article. And then uh, the State Bar of Michigan put together um, a great resource, Video Conferencing 101, where it reminds you of basic steps. So as we kind of venture onto this, uh, this world of video conferencing. Um, we have to be members of the legal community and perform our function there, but we also have to be technologists. For instance, uh, Beth at the beginning of this 
mention that you should always try and plug your computer directly into your router rather than using Wi-Fi. Um, you have to figure out which, uh, which microphone works with which platform, for instance. Um, and so we have to wear many hats. Another hat is production specialist. So if you see Beth's background, it's, it's got a very nice backdrop. But uh, if you're going to a deposition or to a court hearing, uh, guitars hanging in the background may not be the best option there. Um, and so this resource from the, the State Bar of Michigan actually has a checklist that helps you remember uh, all the different aspects of what you have to do when you're using video conferencing. And so I recommend take a look at that. It, it says it's tips for Michigan lawyers, but but really it's, it's tips for all lawyers. So it's a great resource. Um, moving on to uh, the note at the bottom of the sheet there, uh, visit the virtual reference desk uh, from the Harris County Law Library. As I mentioned, our law librarians are still working and we're still uh, uh, interested in providing resources that support the local legal community, especially in this time when uh, there's so many new, uh, new requirements going on and uh, you know, special orders that, that are going around and that sort of thing. If anyone needs assistance uh, with legal research, uh, they're welcome to contact us by email. You can also call and leave a voicemail. And um, but we're also working with our vendors. So for instance, um, as I mentioned, we have hundreds of people coming into the law library every day when we're not under stay at home. Uh, a lot of those folks are going there to access uh, things like Westlaw and Lexus. Um, it, it, they may not have access to outside of the law library. And so we're working with our vendors to make information from those platforms as well as the state bar practice manuals and uh, Hein Online available remotely. Uh, now, for each vendor, um, it's a little bit different as to document limits and that sort of thing. But if you need access to something like that, that you remote practice, uh, the law library is here to uh, help you with that. All right, and uh, questions at the end. So uh, I will go ahead and hand it off to Michael Hoffrichter from Houston Volunteer Lawyer. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Hoffrichter with Houston Volunteer Lawyers. Uh, and I just wanted to say that we're also doing sort of the same thing, right? We're uh, moving into a virtual realm of uh, providing legal advice and legal services remotely. And so while this CLE is going on right now, uh, HBL is doing our first uh, virtual uh, clinic uh, with clients where both the client and the um, and the attorneys are all remote. Right? We've done this in the past where the clients were in our office and they were meeting with volunteers and now everything's remote. And so uh, this is something that we're all getting used to. Uh, there's still pro bono volunteer opportunities. We're still looking for volunteers to take pro bono cases. And those, as you can see, uh, those cases are still continuing to move. Um, I also want to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, and in addition to those pro bono cases, right, we run the pro se self-help booth in the basement of the law library and on the top floor of the courthouse. Uh, and while pro se's aren't walking into either of those locations now, we've transitioned that service to a phone service and are continuing that as well. Um, so the resources are still out there. We're always looking uh, more for volunteers uh, and uh, for clients who need it. And as we can see by some of the unemployment numbers yesterday, uh, there's going to be a lot of people asking for our services over the next uh, months, uh, weeks and months. And so we're, we're expecting to, to see an increase in demand as things go along. Um, the uh, other thing that I really want to point out is this is all like there's a whole bunch of different platforms out there, right? As Joe pointed out in his uh, list, and we're all trying to figure out what what is the right platform for me. Right, uh, HBL has been using Microsoft Teams because we are an Office 365 shop. Um, but I, I know my mom is using Google because her work is a Google shop. Uh, and so there's a lot of times where you can just work off of what you are already got, what you already have to get a lot of these resources. And the biggest thing that I can say is to go into the options behind any of these things and really explore. Because it's only when you explore that you realize that Zoom has the virtual backdrops or it has the ability to, when you record, to export to a video option that is easy to edit by a third-party video provider, or um, right to to touch up your face, 
right? Uh, and that's one of those options that's in Zoom that's not in all of these other platforms. And so it's important to really explore some of those resources uh, and to realize that you're not the only one exploring those resources right now. And there's a lot of uh, good sites that are out there. Um, I'm gonna drop um, uh, two links into this um, uh, solution, right? And to, uh, uh, this right now, uh, and then uh, I'll try and drop them into the um, the chat window on uh, YouTube as well, so you can see those. Uh, this first one that I'm linking to is, uh, for anyone who's familiar with Bob Ambrogi, uh, he is uh, one of the regular people talking about uh, legal tech resources, and he writes about it, uh, and he's been uh, blogging about it for years. Uh, and he's got a whole list of long coronavirus resources and different organizations and tech companies that are making their legal aimed project products available at discounts or uh, donations or um, uh, free trials available for free. So that's, uh, I dumped that in both the YouTube chat and uh, the Adobe Connect chat. Um, and I, I really strongly recommend browsing that list because it's it's a long and it's extensive, and sometimes you don't realize what happened remotely that could happen remotely. Um, the other thing is that we're not the only people talking about it, right? Um, right. There's also the ability, uh, one of the great things that we've been doing is we've been chatting with a lot of people. Uh, and uh, chatting is great, um, and it gives us the ability to, um, to ask those questions and to see how other people are doing it. Uh, uh, I managed to find that, uh, a um, Slack channel that was dedicated solely to uh, providing additional resources for legal technicians, legal uh, attorneys and related fields, right? And so there's been some discussions on that Slack about pro bono work, and there's been some discussions about notaries, and there's been some discussions about video conferencing. And it, uh, these are all free resources that are out there that are doing what we're doing today and providing a method for you to ask questions, to get multiple things together and be, be able to provide those uh, to attorneys and firms uh, to figure out what's, what's next. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've all seen is uh, start with what you know, right? Start with what you've got. Uh, call your phone provider, call your uh, internet provider and say, can you add on this service? Right? and start there. And then if, if they can't do it, then start looking for other solutions. And then you start seeing, all right, well, this is Adobe Connect. Do I like this? Uh, it works for this setting, right? My kid's using Zoom for school, right? I get to watch over her shoulder and see, uh, is that what I wanna be using? Uh, and so these, these all work together and we're not the only people uh, going through this. And so that, that's a really big thing to realize that these are all um, uh, going together. Um, right, and uh, that's that's what I have to say. And um, I hope that you all take this opportunity to to jump in, um, to both uh, be those regular people doing depositions and uh, taking advantage of these uh, solutions, but also taking advantage of the uh, the pro bono opportunities that are out there and the resources that are out there for everyone else uh, to help out as well. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so those are all our speakers today, and I'm not sure. I'm going to change this. I'm going to scroll through here really quick to see if there are any questions. I'm not sure. If, uh, Judge, there you are. Uh, I think he ran away to go get a drink of water, I'm assuming. So um, I'm just going to scroll through here and see if there are any questions that we can ask. I Once again, I really thank everybody for joining us. I do want to apologize for that little... Uh, confusion at the beginning just like we're all going to experience um we're all going to experience some issues with this it's just patience these things can get um, taken care of i'm sure if you have someone who is comfortable with this software and knows what they're doing is helpful i know a lot of court reporters at this time are offering this to the ordering attorney sometimes free as long you know as long as you're ordering the transcript and stuff like that so don't hesitate to ask your court reporting agency or your videographer uh, a lot of us have a lot of we're a lot of comfortability with doing video conferencing that's what we do i know that i've seen a lot of people on here saying hey you can just record this i'm not sure that um you would want to do that or leave it to the professionals just because if you record this you're recording 
everything you see here. Um, we can definitely just record the witness or the documents. We can do them picture in picture any way you want. So you'll get a little bit more of a professional if you're going to show this to a jury or professional video like you're used to. I'm going to look real quick and see if there are any. Um, Cassandra was asking, do you have to pre-mark exhibits or can you restructure as you go along? I think that Carolyn and Renee will agree with me that pre-marked exhibits are, would be wonderful. We can have them up and loaded, but if there is something that you can restructure, we can certainly, just like you saw everyone was doing, you can pull in your own documents and then you can share them to the court reporter to mark afterward. Is that correct, ladies, or am I? Uh... Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. pre-marking is not a requirement. It just makes things run a little bit more smoothly since we're all learning how to do this anyway. If we can, you know, make something that's a little bit easier for everybody during the process, that's one thing that can be done, but it's not required. And we understand that you may not know until you get into the proceedings and the witness may make some comment which leads you over to document number 20 that you now want to mark as exhibit number three. So we understand that and we just all have to work together as we go through and figure it out. Okay, um, so someone, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Today, if I can. Yes? Yes. Um, in the case that we were in depositions this week, there were over 50,000 documents exchanged in discovery. 50,000, 50,000. There's no way that you can show up with all those documents. What we did was we sent those documents ahead of time to the court reporter, court videographer, the people doing the technical work, and they were able to have them so that when we say go to document 10510 through 10510, those documents were then pulled back up and put right in front of the witness. So depending on the case, you can go a little slower, but to answer your question to the person asking, it, the more complicated the case, the more prepared you have to be. And if we took three days of depositions with thousands and thousands of documents, by doing so ahead of time, being prepared, everybody has the bait stamp documents. So you just call them up and then attach a label to it, exhibit one through whatever. It's like, a, and really, if you, when you name your documents, Name them so they're easy to find and easy for someone to understand what they are. That would help too. Um, let me see. We have a question that says, what platform are you using to work through the exhibits? I'm assuming that you're asking about the exhibits that we were showing or the pseudo exhibits that we were showing. That's just the, what we use is the Adobe Connect. They're just PDFs. They're coming in. We're entering them in and then we're sharing them where they can download them and um, and print them or do whatever they want. So there's nothing special, any platform. This is through the video conferencing platform. I'm pretty sure Zoom has something pretty identical to this. Um, so, you know, most of the, the better platforms will have this where you don't actually have to share your screen. You can just upload the exhibit, the actual document. Um, let me see. Melinda Bible Kane is saying with a video conference, is there a way to get a video record that we can edit for use at trial? Yes, that's kind of, I think we've all touched on that. I don't really think it's appropriate to um, record your screen. I think there are too many people in here, and depending on the way it works, I just don't think that would be appropriate to show to a jury. Uh, obviously, I'm a videographer. I'm going to tell you it's a good idea to try to get as professional of a video as you can get. Um, but, you know, if that's your only option, it would certainly work. I can't promise you that something's not going to glitch and you might lose that recording and there's not a backup. So if you really want a professional and a, um, stable with a backup recording, I would suggest you just like the court reporters, just order a videographer also. This can all be done remotely on our side just as well. Um, let me see. So uh, someone else was asking this, what platform is this? Zoom or something else? Can all the platforms do what she is teaching? So again, Zoom and Adobe Connect, I think are, I would venture to say pretty much the top runners. They can pretty much do what each other does. I think they're both just like Kleenex is the tissue. They're both, they offer all this stuff, the breakout rooms. I'm not 100% familiar with Zoom. I, I have used it several times. 
I'm a little more familiar with Adobe Connect just because I've had it many years and the breakout rooms and all that. But my understanding is that Zoom can pretty much, I know Renee, Carolyn, you guys use this stuff a lot. So um, you use yes. Zoom. Judge, yeah. you use Zoom. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, we use Zoom. And just to let you know, that's what all the courts in Texas have been given a license to is Zoom. So if you're going to come for the majority, I think, uh, courts, I think we'll be using Zoom. I know that we Zoom, see, I'm sorry, go ahead, Judge. And we see um, a lot of cross discussion in mean, the district court judges association statewide, people troubleshooting and talking about their experiences and it's all almost exclusively uh, the, the Zoom product. Right. Zoom is very big. I know they do, for those of you, they do have a 30-day free trial. And I could be wrong, but my understanding is that that only allows you 40 minutes of conference time, up to 25. For the free version. Yeah. Right. Now, Adobe Connect has a free version. It offers a lot more. I, I Not that I'm touting it, but it's, it's a 90-day free version. I would encourage you, if you're looking, there's no time limit. So, and it offers you more hosts, where I've made all these guys hosts. It's not one-on-one. -on -one. You can have as many people in here talking. So I would just encourage you to look. Most of these streaming, um, if, you have, if you have Microsoft Office, Microsoft 365, you get Microsoft Teams for free. I, a lot of people don't know that. Um, I played with it a little bit today. It works. It works. It's not quite as sophisticated, but it, it does work. And if you already have Microsoft, it's free. So let me look and see if there are some other questions on here. Um, Beth. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Beth, can I just make one more clarification just because I know a lot of people, I was confused about this as well at the beginning, but you don't have to purchase the Zoom application in order to, log uh, in. you know, go to your proceed or log on for, to your proceedings. Uh, the court coordinators of the courts are going to be sending you the link right. to join the hearing. Okay. So it's not anything you have to purchase. You can download, you'll, you do have to download the application onto your mobile phone or your desktop, iPad, whatever you choose to use, um, but it's free, okay? Correct, and I'm sorry about that. So so Carolyn, is she's talking more with the courts, and then I'm kind of on the other side with depositions, where I'm assuming that you'll want to set this up. So yes, if, if anybody sends you a link, like I've sent everyone a link, no one has to sign up for anything. Like, you know, I don't know if any other stuff that you have to sign up before you can get in all of this you will have to download an application every one of these video conferencing or application run so you will have to down the, the application to download takes about 30 to 45 seconds it is not long you can usually do it pretty quickly it's not going to hurt your computer but yeah but if the court if anyone sends you the link there is no signing up literally all you do is put your name in to show who the attendee is at that meeting. Correct, ladies? Yeah, Beth. Mm -hmm. So if I can add from the deposition point of view, uh, going back to what I was stating earlier about the court reporting firms, they have purchased an account. So Correct. they can be the ones to go ahead and, and schedule the meeting, send out the invites, and then everybody attending, like we are saying, just clicks on the link and joins. Right. Very easy. Correct. And that's the same, just like this one here. This is a purchase account. It's not free. Um, it's not one of the free 90-day trials or 30-day trials. And, and you know, it's available at all times, and as many people can get on. So, so definitely, the court reporters can send you the links and run it. That's, that's all. It, no issues. Let me see if there's any other questions that I need to follow up on. I know there were a few for you, Judge. So... Beth, just add real quickly, this is Joe. Um, just like Renee was saying earlier, the time to uh, uh, try out your Zoom connection is before you actually have to attend a hearing, so make sure you look at their support page, look at their support videos and training videos, and download all that stuff before you actually have to show up to court. Um, I want to put this out there. Um, Charles Peacom said, some courts are doing no oral hearings, only submissions. Will clog things up and slow down cases. Kudos to the judges using tech. Um, let's see. I'll take it. All right, that's what I thought. I'm sorry. There's there's many uh, there's many things on here, so I'm trying to read as fast as I can. So sorry, guys. 
If we don't get to your question, I'm not going to hold everybody up. If we don't get to your question, we will look these over. Um, Ms. Swanson asked if the order is on the court's page. It is. I think they found that further down here that somebody did mention that your court order is on the page. It was on your website. About three or four links, three or two or three links below the docket listing. Okay. So I think I think we've um, I have a client who is asking about electronic service of subpoenas for documents under Rule 176.5. Any chance we can address that? Uh, that's more of a clerk issue. I think that, um, and generally speaking, under the Texas Supreme Court emergency orders, a lot of things are being relaxed. Uh, you might do well to get ask a court for leave to do that ahead of time, set that for submission, get a ruling on it from the court, get an order that allows it to be done. That's probably the most the easiest thing to do, so you don't have to, you're not wasting your time and have to and have it quashed or, or avoided at the back end. Okay. One more. Will the media, um, hang on a minute. Will the media be able to play anything they see in the hearings that they save from the live streaming? Don't recall what the rules are about cameras in the courtroom. The YouTube videos the, or the live stream to YouTube is deleted at the probably the end of the day on Monday. I don't know whether you're able to capture them on your end when the when the live stream is occurring on YouTube, for example, if the public were to attend such a hearing. Um, but uh, as far as they're not going to be housed or cataloged on our respective YouTube pages for more than a few hours. If uh, generally speaking, Cameras, uh, I allow cameras in the courtroom unless there's some sort of sensitive issue and as long as they're not disruptive. If this is analogous to, to that, I mean, the whole purpose of streaming these live to YouTube is so that they're open to the public. Um, if, that, if the side effect of that is, and I haven't really thought all that through, but if the side effect of that is they are then de facto or, and as a matter of course, shared on the evening news, um, you know, that, that may be something we all have to be cognizant of. So that was another question. Are there rules on recording the YouTube hearings? Like could someone record it on their computer or is it ethically allowed? Well, record, we have an instruction on our docket page that recording the proceedings uh, is not allowed. And just like you can't really have a recorder in the Court, in the, you can't you know turn on your phone and record a hearing in the courtroom. Um, the media is a different issue, I think. And so, we're, if this was recorded for the by the media to be used, uh, that's a different issue. Uh, they might need to request permission. They often, tr at least traditionally, request permission to come into the courtroom for a hearing that's of public interest. It may be the fact that we're they're live streaming YouTube videos of our hearings in and of itself, irrespective of the nature of the hearing, may be newsworthy for a short while. Um, and and the, the news may just want to talk about the fact that we are now streaming our hearings to YouTube. And here's an example of that. Setting, as, aside from that, the substance of the hearing and the issue about we want to show the public a hearing because it is of public interest, I don't think that has changed, whether they get that from YouTube or, uh, or elsewhere is just a, it, it's still, but we have uh, local rules pertaining to media in the courtrooms and those still have to be observed. Yeah, and I can add, Judge, that just like in any sensitive case or protective uh, information that we don't want to get out of the courtroom, we could then go to the judge and say, Judge, for this particular hearing, we would like to have a protection of not putting it on YouTube because now this is the new normal. If it's gonna be out there, and I know there's some sensitive information, I would tell the court ahead of time, and then the court can say, you know what, for this particular hearing, I'm gonna grant that request for protection and keep it off. Whether it's proprietary information or children or an ad litem hearing or some specific area that I think is protected, I think we can still use those rules, whether the media is outside or in the courtroom, uh, in the hallway or in the courtroom, we can ask the court for protection for those particular cases. I think that still falls within the rules and the courts will entertain those motions. 
And, and it's pretty rare, in, just in the normal circumstances, to have a request from an attorney to close the courtroom, exclude somebody from the courtroom, or uh, and and you're right. Some of the, some of those cases, uh, perhaps in family courts or, ju or juvenile courts, are maybe more sensitive, and those judges may not be streaming their their hearings to YouTube by by as a matter of course. Uh, we have a, we deal with as the bar knows, and I'm sure the attendees know, we deal with a lot of trade secret type cases. But even in those cases, whether it's temporary injunction hearings or actual trials summary judgments, et cetera, um, very rarely do we actually get a request to exclude certain people from the courtroom. We're not trying cases right now, so and we're certainly not trying them by video conference right now, so invoking the rule, uh, um, you know, under the Texas Rules of Evidence is not really uh, something that comes up, but again, it, it can be, the analog can, can be ex excluding somebody or putting somebody in using the, um, the waiting room feature or the breakout feature to exclude somebody from the proceeding is something that we'll probably have to get more uh, conversant or, or familiar with. Okay, Judge, I'm going to do two more questions. One is, has there been any consideration for one order covering all of our courts? On this issue of video, video conferences or something else? Well, I'm looking and... Uh, Judge, have you discussed having one order covering all the courts? And then someone said something about a uniform order coming out next week, but it doesn't really. Maybe that's something we can they can clarify real quick. I'll wait we to have, see that. We, I will tell you without breaching any conferences that there are ongoing discussions about similar orders. Um, don't know whether we a vote. We 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 expect to vote perhaps on that topic. Don't know what the outcome of that will be, whether there'll be a uniform order or a bunch of very, what I imagine to be very similar orders pertaining to, again, the order that I was discussing earlier has to do with motions to quash in relation to video depositions being done remotely. And that, that, that's the, really the only topic that order uh, covers. Okay, and then uh, I think one more. Laura Kemp, how will we deal with documents required to be notarized? Does unsworn declaration still require an actual signature? What if they type their name and do an electronic signature? I think there is, I thought I saw in one of the Supreme Court's emergency orders, or even in the governor's uh, declarations or order proclamations, that there was a, something dealing with remote notarization um, I, I think there is something out there. You might have to hunt around for it. Um, and there's probably, I know that there's a number of the places like the bar are um, warehousing all of these different orders. I'm pretty sure I saw something about relaxing the rules on notarizing things or the ability to obtain original signatures on things during this crisis. I Im imagine that um, those kinds of rules are, uh, can be relaxed or have been relaxed. Judge, and, and some of those... It's not an advisory opinion. It's not an advisory opinion. Specifics. I can't tell you the specifics, but there are uh, laxing of evidentiary rules and rules like that by the Texas Supreme Court orders that are coming out. And there's more to come out. I will tell you that there are also... But that doesn't take away the rules that apply to court reporters to sign off on the verification of the witness. In other words, you can't lax the fact that somebody's doing an electronic signature by laxing the rules of the court reporter or the, or the notary to swear that that person, they have verified to the authenticity of that person. So there's gonna be some laxing, but in order for us to function in our rules and in our court system with some reliability, then we're gonna to have to hold still those professional ethics of all the different parties involved, including notaries and lawyers. Let, let me ask Renee, uh, or Carolyn, Renee, when you're in a private deposition, do you expect, uh, for, for example, under my court order or similar orders, if you're not in the same room as the witness, uh, are you asking them to hold up a copy of their driver's license or, or, fact, or 
take a picture of the driver's license and send it to you, or how, is, how are you uh, verifying their identity? Right, so I would first, and I would do this first just off the record, um, is before we get started, I would ask them to show me their driver's license. If I know ahead of time and can ask the attorney representing the witness to get a copy of that to me, great. That probably won't happen. Um, and I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know if uh, this next option is, is valid or not, but we were also wondering if if the witness's counsel can also verify the identity of the of the wit you know of the witness. If it's a party to the case, surely other attorneys that are participating can verify, yes, this is Joe Smith. Um, but at the very least, we would look for the uh, driver's license and record that number. And we haven't really talked about if we need to put it as part of the transcript. We don't want to put, you know, that kind of information in a transcript. It's usually redacted, but we could have it as part of our records if we needed it. Well, Benny, you usually, I mean, one of your first questions is uh, show me a copy of your driver's license, right? Yeah, we'll say state your name and then get some identification. If we don't know who the person is, if it's a party, uh, like she mentioned, if it's a party, we're more lax about that. But uh, if it's a eyeball third party witness that we need to identify or nail down the authenticity of this person, uh, then we would likely go a little further. Uh, show me the driver's license. Tell me where you live and we can get some extra information on this witness. If it's one, it's not a party and we need to make sure uh, on either side of the case, uh, who this witness really is. Um, Judge, there was a little bit of a clarification on that question we were asking earlier. It was a clarification to the question, order similar to the 151st. If there's just going to be an yes, overall uh, coverage. It, it is possible, I cannot promise, that there will be a, an order that covers mo all the 24 district civil district courts, for example, or or most of the 24 civil district courts, or that similar orders will be propounded by most of the courts. Um, I, I don't. I, I know that's a discussion. I know we're meeting, and I know the, I'm pretty sure there'll be a vote. I cannot. I, I'm not trying to hide the ball. Uh, I just don't know the, what the outcome will be. Okay, guys. Well, I appreciate everybody joining us today. I appreciate all of our um, live streaming. This I thought went really well. I think you can all see that we had seven of us on here and really no hiccups, a few audio. I think one of the things we all discovered in the live chat also is that Bluetooth headphones, probably if you're able to avoid them, might be a good idea. Um, Michael, no issues. And maybe not those big ball things either. <laughs> Joe. Um, but <laughs> um, anyway, I think it went really well. You can see nobody dropped off. We had no issues with this. So, and this is two hours. So it went really well. I think everybody could hear and see in the documents. So if anyone has any questions, please, you know, reach out to Ashley. Ashley will be with the HBA. We'll be posting this as soon as we get it out to you. It will be recorded and you guys will all have it. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to say? I have one last thing so we can make sure we get our ethics credit that it is our opinion at the Houston Bar Association that you have as lawyers an ethical duty to do your work remotely when necessary to in order to follow the rules of our state governor and our local uh, county judge. So the lawyers are trying to set up appointments via video chat or phone call conferences with their clients so that we can follow that duty that is on us now as lawyers that uh, will protect us ethically to do the best we can to follow along uh, with the court orders and with the judges and governor's orders. So part of this conference is to get CLE credit, but we will also have 0.25 credit hours to ethics for those that are participating as lawyers. And again, thank you, Beth, and thank you, Cody, and thank you to Houston Bar Association staff, Ashley, and all of you for a great work and great teamwork to get this done for our members and for all the lawyers of the greater Houston area. Thank you.
Okay, thank you again, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, a lot of really nice comments about how helpful this was and people that would like to see us come out with this again if we have new information. So I think we'll all be happy to do that, and you guys have a good day. Bye, everyone.